I want to express my gratitude for the organizers for inviting me to speak at this meeting. I'm honored. I'm particularly honored by the fact that Her Majesty Queen Sophia is uh, can, can overseeing this conference. I'm particularly honored because she is one of the patrons for Alzheimer's uh, disease. And for that, I'm very grateful and acknowledge her uh, contribution to the, to the field. Uh, the main topic of my talk is really intended to uh, change the thinking about Alzheimer's disease because we're at a historic junction in Alzheimer's disease research. Although the disease was first described by Alois Alzheimer's in 906, the modern era of biological studies began in 1961 in the UK. It came at the uh, Newcastle upon Tyne by a group started by Sir Martin Roth and the group that he put together. The very first meeting, scientific meeting, was in 1961 in that period. So that's the beginning of Alzheimer's research. In the United States, we began developing the program in the 70s. In that period, Alzheimer's disease was not well known. The number of scientists were only a handful, and the total amount of money spent for research was minuscule. Family members did not have any support groups. There was very little interest in the scientific community or public policy makers in Alzheimer's. Today, the picture has changed. We have close to 5,000 scientists around the world who are interested in Alzheimer's. There have been several networks that have been organized, such as the one in Spain, that the group you have. Similarly, in UK, in Germany, there is a network. In France, is being organized. Many countries have begun to develop uh, national plans. The disease has received the attention of policymakers. OECD issued an uh, analytical report in 2013, which I prepared. Uh, the uh, UK Prime Minister, uh, David Cameron, convened the G8 summit that dealt with dementia. WHO has convened a meeting. On all. So the policymakers have begun to recognize the importance of the problem because Everyone knows that this is the mega problem for the 21st century, largely due to the revolution in uh, uh, the aging population. The, that is the revolution in longevity. People are living longer and longer. Uh, people are, many of the baby boomers are destined to live beyond age 100. Imagine if someone gets the disease at age 60 uh, 30, 40 years ago, by age 70, most people died, so they had disability for 10 years. For the future, we're looking at disability for over 40 years, and that's going to cost tremendous amount to healthcare systems. That's why the burden is economic, social, uh, scientific, and we have no choice but to solve the problem. Either that or be willing to ration healthcare, or not allow people to live beyond a certain point because we can't afford it. Of course, there is an ethical problem with that solution. So the only solution is to invest into research, research and development to accelerate the technologies for early detection of the disease and technologies for prevention. So the major reason for my presentation is to find ways in which the scientific community could pick up the challenge and accelerate research and development to find ways in which we could uh, 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 slow or prevent this disease. One of the important issues is for this in order to happen, we need to have a new thinking about the disease and the need to for new thinking is underscored by several factors. First, emerging knowledge regarding the biology of the disease shows that we're dealing with a complex and heterogeneous disease. So that's one reason why we need to think about the disease differently. Second reason is the failure of many of the clinical trials during the last 20 years, 
many of the trials have not worked because they were based on current conceptual models of the disease which uh, have their limitations. Third reason is emerging knowledge regarding the biology of the disease is, requires a new paradigm uh, for understanding the multiple interactions on a polygenic origin. The disease is not due to a single factor, but it's due to multiple factors. And we need to understand how these various etiologic factors interact along with many of the potential risk factors. During the last 10 or 15 years, we have identified several potential risk factors, including preventative, protective risk factors, such as education and, and so forth. So we need to understand how these interact in uh, the, uh, the advancing the disease. Current treatments have not worked. Uh, they're not adequate. They, right now, they work for about two years at the most. After that, the disease progresses and the patient is back to where they were. Therefore, the current treatments are not adequate for solving the large societal problem for the reasons that I mentioned, that the disease is gonna last 30, 40 years of a patient. So we need to find ways in which we could ameliorate those conditions over that long course or prevent it from happening in the first place. Existing paradigms for drug discovery and development need to be rethought through. We need to find new ways of doing clinical trials in order to develop new therapeutic targets. So those are some of the reasons why rationale for the uh, initiative of creating a uh, uh, new way of thinking, new conceptual models for the disease. Current models have failed to provide effective therapeutic targets for complex disease like Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is only one example of complex chronic brain disorders. Whatever I say applies to other chronic late life disorders. Alzheimer's is the prototype for it, but the same applies for uh, Parkinson's, Huntington's, and so on. We need to account for the causal relationships between not only the biological phenotypes, but also the clinical phenotypes. So far, most of our treatments have focused on addressing the biological phenotypes, but have not failed to account for the clinical phenotype. So we need to understand what is the relationship between those two. Presently, no single theory encompasses all of the known, well-documented facts about aging and Alzheimer's disease. During the last 40 years, we've learned quite a bit about the brain aging and Alzheimer's disease. However, a lot of our knowledge is fragmented. They're not connected, so we need to find ways in which to connect. Part of the reason for launching this initiative of uh, new conceptual models is to stimulate new thinking about underlying neurobiology of complex brain disorders, such as Alzheimer's disease, dementia, neurodegenerative disorders. A second reason is to sort out the complexities of the condition to redefine the neuropathologic entity along with complex correlates of dementia. So the specific aim of this initiative is the way it's going to work is we have organized a work group. A work group consists of uh, some of the world opinion leaders, including Professor Rosser, uh, who is here, uh, who have contributed to creating a, a format for the way in which we're going to solicit new conceptual models. The Alzheimer's and Dementia Journal of the Alzheimer's Association is going to devote a special section of the journal called Special Topics, devoted for considering perspective papers on new conceptual models. So I'll be describing for you the process by which that's going to take place. And we're going to invite the world scientific community to participate in rethinking through the, um, uh, that process. So the specific aim of the specific special topic section is A, to create an inventory of ideas. Facts means processes for comparing various uh, theories. Provide a knowledge management tool. We hope that eventually we'll be able to have 
all of the ideas, all of the pathways on a web-based uh, program so that scientific community could start comparing different ideas from the amyloid hypothesis, tau hypothesis, inflammation, calcium hypothesis. What is the relationship? How the signaling pathways that account for each one of those are connected. So that would be a web-based tool to uh, allow scientific community to compare and contrast. We hope to produce a common framework for considering different conceptual models, different ways of thinking about the disease. And eventually, we want to publish a comprehensive inventory of these different ideas. Shortly, I'll show you some examples of this. So the ideal feature for a unifying theory on dementia, mind you, right now, we do not have a unifying theory. So this is for the future. Uh, it, the ideal theory must account for both biological and clinical phenotypes. That is, you have to account for not only the, for the path, plaques and tangles, synapse loss, but also you need to account for how the cognitive changes occur, depression, uh, agitation, sleep loss. Those are the clinical features. What is the relationship between those two needs to be ironed out. Provide an explanation for a specificity of the neuronal system that's affected. The disease does not affect every part of the brain. It only affects certain structures, certain neurons. We need to understand why some parts of the brain are susceptible, why certain neurons are susceptible and others are not. And that specificity needs to be accounted for. We need to account for all the major risk factors uh, in the disease, whether it be genetic, head trauma, education, there's a large number that have been identified. Another factor the ideal theory has to account for is the heterogeneity of the biological and behavioral signs of the disease. The disease is not a single disease, but appears to be a syndrome of multiple types. There's enormous variety. We need to account for that uh, variation. Another factor is that the disease appears to start many, many years before the clinical feature appears. So there's a prolonged period when the disease starts. And we know very little about the very early asymptomatic stages of the disease. The theory needs to account for the relationship where when it starts, and how it progresses through into later life. And finally, uh, the theory needs to propose testable hypotheses so that we can validate the ideas uh, of uh, whatever is proposed. Okay, here is an example of the heterogeneity of the disease. Uh, this, uh, this is ability of the person to function. Uh, this is age some arbitrary cutoff point for uh, behavior. In some people in the population age quite well and they decline fairly late. Others cross this threshold point at various times. So we need to understand what causes that heterogeneity. Why? We know some of it. We know that certain genetic uh, variables account for this. It might be there are some lifestyle variability that accounts for we need to account for why this heterogeneity occurs, because if we understand that, that might give us therapeutic targets for uh, treatment. Because if I understand what is the genetic and lifestyle variables that allow this individual to develop the disease at age 100, and they had dementia for one day or two days, versus a person that developed it at age uh, 60, and disabled for 30 or 40 years, that knowledge will give me a way to develop a therapeutic uh, strategy in being able to do so. For that reason, it's important to sort out why this heterogeneity occurs. Most of the studies we've done so far during the last 40, 50 years has focused on the period after the symptoms appear, uh, after the person develops the cognitive changes and so on. Now the new era, we need to be operating in this area where before the symptoms appear. And that's the rationale for the OECD proposal to create the big data. That's the rationale for having your network, the network that's in UK, the network that's in Germany. Now people are beginning to follow 
healthy older individuals longitudinally so that we can find out what are some of these early changes that would allow us to predict what's happening. And uh, that's a very, very important resource uh, that needs to be uh, developed. Now, during the last several years, we have developed several biomarkers. This is from uh, uh, Cliff Jack from uh, ADNI. Uh, I'll go through very quickly. Uh, there are a large number of biomarkers. Uh, some of them are, uh, appear at very early stages in the cognitive normal stage, during the MCI stage, dementia. Uh, most of these are developed on the basis of uh, association with large populations. What we need to do now is translate that knowledge into being able to identify what is the causal relationship between these biological markers and the origin of the disease. We, in other words, we need to reverse engineer from the disease in what way some of these biological markers can be used as predictive models to allow us to predict accurately the likelihood of a person developing the disease in the asymptomatic stages. Remember, the, the payoff is going to be in these very early stages before the symptoms appear where uh, the person has not yet developed. Can we develop the new uh, uh, computational methods by having large numbers of samples, having a lot of information on genetic and other information that we have collected into developing algorithm technologies for early and accurate prediction of who is going to get the disease. The big payoff for the field is going to be if we have the technology for accurately detecting the disease in a person at age 20 or 30 by having information on their profile and be able to track that individual through their life, lifetime. This is what I'm talking about. This is a pattern of the age this is the various stages of neurodegenerative disorders. Uh, very early stage, some, there are risk factors. Some of these are genetic, others are lifestyle. As time goes on, uh, there is a biological marker, some, some indication, but there is no symptom. Uh, after time goes on, disability sets in, eventually the person dies. This slide illustrates everything. It strikes the heterogeneity. Some people go through this course very early, others go later, others go much later. As I said, the most of knowledge we have now has been derived from this period. We're now trying to move into this area and be able to identify these very early risk factors in order to be able to predict which trajectory the person is going to take. Is the person going to be a healthy individual, live to age 120 without any decrement? or they're going to take a very rapid course or a moderate course. More importantly, what can we do to change the course? That's going to be the payoff. That's going to be the challenge. So the, that's the scientific challenge. In order to do that, we need to be thinking about the disease differently than we have done in the past. And that's the rationale for the presentation today. The ultimate aim of the disease is this. Uh, this is a metaphor for what's called synaptic reserve. This is a healthy individual. The person that's healthy has a neuron that has thousands and thousands of connections. But for some reason, variety of reasons, gradually as the disease progresses, uh, they lose these contact points and gradually it's diminished to that. Uh, that's, as I said, it's a metaphor uh, from developing neuron I'm using it as reversing backwards into Alzheimer's. So Alzheimer's is uh, gradually moving from a neuron that's very healthy, a lot of connections, into a point where it's not. And this really perhaps is the explanation for the clinical features we, um, we describe. Now, there are many reasons why a cell will lose neurons and synapses. Uh, it may lose it because of uh, toxins, it may lose because of trauma, it may lose because of inflammation, it may lose of because of toxins like amyloid, or it may lose it because tau uh, 
protein prevents the exoplasmic flow. So there are a large number of ideas in the field of why this comes about. The problem is that none of these have really led to effective therapies, simply because the problem is a lot more complex than we've thought through. Here are some ideas, some of the ideas that have been around. Aging has been associated with the change that I described. Cholinergic factor was important. Cytotoxicity, amyloid cascade, tau, my favorite, calcium hypothesis, inflammation, oxidative stress, and on and on. And here's some more. Genome-wide studies, epigenetic factors. So we have large number of ideas what causes the, the phenomena that I described, that is the loss of neurons, the loss of contacts. So in order for us to change our thinking, we have to introduce some new ideas. So one idea is a concept of complexity. I'll describe what I mean by that. The second idea is emergent behavior. And the third idea is systems theory. So we're going, I'm going to explain each one of these and then put it together into the framework for rethinking about the conceptual model of Alzheimer's. So let's first look at complexity. Very simple illustration of complexity. What I'm going to do is create a brain with 20 neurons. One to 20. There'll be, this brain is going to have 20 neurons. If I have one neuron, and the, the, this brain is, all it's going to be required is to count. It's going to count from one to one million. That's, that's his job. That's a very simple job, very simple brain. Now, if I have only one neuron, I can only count up to one. I cannot count any higher. In order to count higher, I have to add another neuron. So I can count with two neurons, I can count up to two. With, it, I keep adding neurons, and my ability to count uh, increases. With 20 neurons, I can count to over a million. That gives me a million different combinations. Okay? Now look at the difference. Between 19 and 20, you have almost half a million uh, complexity. That's, that's an emergent complexity in the numerical system. The same thing happens in the... Okay, here is, here is again the same illustration. Between 19 and 20 neurons, there is not much difference in capacity to count. That's a very tremendous capacity. Now let's go look at the brain. This is the brain. The, as we add neurons, the ability of the brain capacity increases and reaches an asymptote. And then as it declines, it declines this way. As, as we take away neurons, uh, it declines. The message here is that in a very complex system, a very small change can have a very, very large effect. So in a fully developed brain, a very, very tiny change, we're going to have a huge effect. The resolution required is enormous. Look at the resolution. It's, that's the resolution. Here, 100% that. Imagine in the human brain where you have 13 to the 13 billion neurons, where you lose few neurons, you have a tremendous effect, yet you're not going to be able to see it. With current methods, we cannot measure it. So we need to develop technologies for detecting minuscule changes in brain circuitry, brain activity uh, at, a, uh, at a level that uh, has an incredible resolution, the likes of which we, have not, we don't have right now. So that's the uh, picture of the complexity. Another issue is the emergent behavior. Now, with the brain, we study, we start with a very complex behavior, and then we simplify that because understanding the brain is very difficult. So we simplify it, get it into lower and lower. This is called reductionistic approach. 
we start with behavior, uh, or uh, in, in, in here we have clinical feature, and we studied the neuronal activity and molecular level. We identified the gene, uh, and so on. Now, this is very useful for understanding the mechanism of complex biological system. In developing therapy, we try to go in the other direction. We go from uh, the rat to the human. We do our experiments in therapy development on the rat with the idea that what it works in the rat or the mice, it's gonna work in the human. And lo and behold, it doesn't work, simply because the model is not adequate. The reason it's not adequate is that there is the phenomenon called emergent behavior. Emergent, the clinical features we're dealing with in complex brain disorders are emergent behavior. They're nonlinear. They, you cannot translate from here to there in the reverse way, in a linear fashion. The organization has different levels of complexity, and we need to understand how do you move from one level to the other. Let me illustrate another way. I may know everything there is to know about the water molecule. I may know everything about the physics. I may know everything about the chemistry. But that knowledge does not allow me to predict tsunami. Tsunami is, after all, due to water molecules, right? The same way in genetics. I may be able to know everything there is to know about the genome, but that doesn't allow me to predict a treatment. We've known the gene for Huntington's for many years. It hasn't been translated into the treatment yet. I may know everything there is to know about the primary, secondary molecule of a protein, but it doesn't allow me to predict its folding characteristics or how it's going to interact with another protein because that's an emergent characteristic of that system. So the concept of emergent characteristics is an important one, and we need to uh, deal with it in order in developing the models that we have. And computational models, perhaps, is going to give us the ways to, uh, to address that. Here is another way of saying what I was saying is we, we go from uh, charged molecules to the uh, complex uh, behavior. This moving the therapy development from here to there has not worked because we don't understand the level of which the abstractions are organized at this level, how they translate into the next and next higher levels. We need to understand that transition points. And that's, that's an important area of science that's not well developed. Okay, the third uh, issue has to do with use of the systems biology, systems uh, model. And I'm going to use that as a prototype example for rethinking of, uh, about the etiology of Alzheimer's disease. This uh, concept is derived from systems theory, which requires for us to identify all the key etiologic components, and we have already done that. We have a large list of ideas that's uh, involved. We need to understand sequence and interaction of these crucial variables. That we don't, we don't have it. We need to change the philosophy of how we do research, and that's very difficult. It's almost like having a religious conversion, which is a very, in science, scientists behave like uh, religious believers. Uh, when they believe in a concept, it's very hard for them to change uh, their ideas. So the, the mindset of how research is conducted in pharmaceutical company needs to change, and that's going to require a heavy lift. Then we need to develop multiple strategies for developing therapies. A single approach may not be a solution, so that a, a, in order for the system to be corrected, you need to attract in a, a complex way. A metaphor for uh, explaining this again is uh, to look at the problem like a car. A Ferrari is a very complex system. Uh, solution for optimizing its performance for a Ferrari may not be sufficient to just change the engine or improve the engine. You can get optimal performance from the engine, but if that engine is not coupled properly with the transmission or doesn't have the right kind of steering or the body shape airflow is not correct, you're not optimizing the performance of that complex system. So the solution will require solving all of those problems at the same time. 
This idea is used in engineering uh, in solving problems like designing air, airplane wings where you're looking at multiple factors and the objective is to optimize the performance of that system. So what we're proposing here is in Alzheimer's, we have a systems failure. Neurons or set of neurons are failing and they're failing for multiple reasons. And our job is to find out what are the key components that go into the operation, optimizing the operation of that system and improving that. And that requires different way of thinking, different way of approaching the problem. So uh, dementia needs to be think about as a uh, systems failure. Uh, and it's another important concept that it's not linear uh, and unitary uh, etiologic factor. That is, it's not caused by just amyloid. It's not just caused by cholinergic. That it's a combination of factors. There is a relationship between the cholinergic system and the metabolic dysfunction through the Krebs cycle. That's never been really studied. We know that if you deprive the neuron of glucose, you uh, have a drastic effect on the nervous system. But cholinergic system gets selectively uh, vulnerable because of that unique relationship. So in our modeling, we need to take that kind of knowledge and use the computer to see what would be the optimal relationship. So in developing cholinergic therapy, perhaps you have to combine it with uh, metabolic uh, stimulation. Uh, just an example. Okay, uh, now let's look at, I'm going to give you an example of looking at the problem uh, from a systems point of view uh, and using uh, all the different ideas, the, these ideas that have been around. I'm going to use them uh, simplify to show how we can design a systems approach to formulate our thinking about uh, Alzheimer's. There are three major category of changes that are required for maintaining the neurons healthy, to keep healthy. One is the energy requirements. We've known for a long time that if you deprive the neuron of glucose and oxygen, the cell dies. Well, you can do that through a variety of ways. You can do it through the mitochondrial defect or vascular changes or perfusion problems. We also know that the, uh, the neuron's viability relies on very large array of signaling systems, neurotransmitters, second messengers, gene regulators, uh, endocrine factors. And then the third factor unique to the neuron is its ability to degrade and synthesize new proteins. The cell membranes, cell embedded uh, proteins are constantly being degraded and re recycled and new ones made. For, that's, that's part of the reason for the amyloid hypothesis that it's a cell uh, membrane that is a cell embedded protein that gets degraded and it's uh, recycled uh, and there's problem. These three systems have to work in synchrony in order to, for the uh, neuron to be functioning properly. Uh, so this, this idea of this going in this direction is due to one of those three categories of changes. Now let's make the problem a bit more complex. Let's add some other variables. These are the three systems. Now we ask the question, in what way aging affects those three systems? And in what way aging is different from a disease entity, whatever that disease might be? We want to know what is the effect of genetics. There's a large number of genetics on the various. We have only begun to scratch the surface. We have studied the genetics of how various protein, uh, the amyloid, tau, uh, and so on. So there, uh, some of the genetics is known. Very little is known about the genetics of the signaling system, but that's another area. Genetics of various vascular or uh, metabolic related issues. There are immune changes that affect endocrine. Neuro this table sort of incorporates all of the ideas that have been around. The problem is that we don't know what the relationships are, and that's what we're looking for. We're trying to create a map, a, looking at the sequence of what comes upstream, what are some of the epidemiologically derived risk factors that come upstream, 
and what are some of the changes that are going on, what's due to aging, what's due to disease, and what are the downstream events, what are the consequences, so that you have a continuous functional flow. Uh, and, and the idea for the exercise that we want to launch over the next two or three years with the scientific community is A, identify all the different ideas, different theories, and look at the relationships, develop the, and put it on the computer so that we can do computer modeling and see if these things work and how we can be manipulated and so on. So that would be the, the general objective of what we're trying to do. And again, this is an invitation for the scientific community to participate. Uh, I sent the editorial that will be appearing in the next issue of the journal. Uh, perhaps those of you who are interested can send me an email. I'll send you a, uh, uh, and a copy of it or uh, invite you to, to participate. So as part of the exercise, in order to make the problem easy, we have identified 10 uh, key questions that each theory, each proposal, each conceptual idea model has to address. First one is risk factors. Uh, the, the important thing is does the theory, whether it's the amyloid hypothesis or tau or the calcium or inflammation, uh, does it address aging as a, does, in what way does it address? Second question is does it address risk factors, uh, whether it be uh, education or uh, uh, lifestyle, uh, genetics. Second area is the progression does the, and sequencing. How does the, uh, the proposed idea, proposal, address the progression of the disease, going from the asymptomatic through MCI uh, to mild and pro get, get into? How, what are the sequences? Which comes first? Does, it, does the metabolic changes, mitochondrial changes occur first? and then uh, the, uh, the neurotransmitter changes, then the protein degradation. What is the sequence of changes that occur? It has to account for mixed pathologies. We see that there is very pure Alzheimer's right now when you look at the neuropathology. Always there is uh, various components, so we need to account for the mixed pathologies. And it needs to account for the multiple clinical phenotypes, such as FTD, uh, we, PCA, frontotemporal dementia, all these have to be accounted for in, by the new theory. How does the theory account for the biomarkers? I showed you the, the ones that have been identified through ADNI and some others are being identified. Does the theory account for this and does it account for the <coughs> sequencing? Finally, does the theory uh, allow us to develop a testable hypothesis so that a therapy could be developed. Uh, with that, I'll close. Again, I want to thank you for uh, inviting me. Uh, I want to express my gratitude to the Her Majesty the Queen for attending and patiently listening to this babble that I'm giving. Perhaps nothing made any sense, but I hope something made sense. Uh, again, thank you.